Vision Broadcast in just a few. And remember, as always, you can join us after the show for our post-show conversation right here at stream.aljazeera.com. Ahmed Baratunde, great to see you both. Uh, there's been an interesting story flowing regarding Google, actually, that's been in the news uh, recently. Talk to us a little bit, Ahmed, about what that's all about. Well, there's a summit in Dublin, and apparently Google, as part of, what's it called, Google Ideas? Google Ideas. It's yeah. their kind of think-slash-do tank. Yeah, so a new think tank that's under the auspice of trying to, uh, I guess, rally and fight against violent extremism of all forms. So yeah. they've kind of rounded up people who might have, in the past, been violent extremists, and they've mm -hmm. called them the formers. And they have a whole campaign on YouTube, on Google, as well as a website against violent extremism um, right here on my on my site, um, you know, they talk about the about. They have some really cool videos as well. And uh, well, what kind of examples are, when they talk about violent extremism? Yeah. Like, what are they? Well, one of the things of? they're trying to do is kind of unite the idea of like gang members, religious extremists, white supremacists, mm -hmm. under the banner of disaffected youth. Yeah. Essentially, the world is going to be half populated by very young people, many of whom don't have jobs, yeah. don't feel a sense of belonging, and often turn to these groups or are preyed upon by these groups for a sense of so-called family, which is generally mm -hmm. trying to exploit them. Yeah. yeah, even nationalists, like yeah. from all kinds of you know different movements across the world. Yeah. And, and do we think that these people are reasonably put into the same group? I mean, is a you know a terrorist group, quote unquote, the same as a gang, the same as uh, you know a person that's involved in a colonial enterprise? I mean, are, is it really the same things that are going on? Does it change if yeah. there's religion going on uh, that falls yeah. into play or? Or poverty. I think Baratunde really hit it, you know, the nail on the head, so to speak, when he said the youth is their angle. Because they, yeah. like right here at the top on their about, I mean, in their words, they say the network believes that radic radicalization is less of a religious and ideological issue uh, and more about the challenges faced by youth around the world. So, you know, it's often born out of youth with no future, no direction, no, you mm -hmm. know, prospects. Yeah. yeah, I mean, part of the reason I ask that, though, mm -hmm. is because you actually see certain, you know, groups that people will label as extremists. Are actually have educated people right. yeah. participating in them, and it's very different when I look at like communities I visit in maybe certain parts of the United States. We've got a lot of poor kids who yeah. don't get access to jobs and opportunities, and they decide that hey, I you know I'm going to be a part of this gang, and this is my crew, this is my family. Yeah. I never grew up with a father, etc. And when you see somebody else who you know has got an advanced degree and decides that they're going to participate in something like the attacks on 9-11. I think mm. part of their premise is that the masses of young people <clears throat> who are kind of getting rounded up in these movements mm -hmm. aren't necessarily the over-educated people. They may be manipulated by those people who are selling them the idea that through this you can find your purpose in life or your true family. Mm -hmm. But if that young person had a job opportunity or a real educational opportunity, they would be less likely mm -hmm. to be swayed by that argument. Like they're trying to mobilize yeah. people as well as these people who are former, so, so to speak, yeah. the former extremists. Yeah. Um, they're trying to mobilize them against violent <coughs> extremism by not focusing on the differences between, you know, a radical religious, uh, someone who's motivated by religion, someone who's motivated yeah. by nationalistic or, you know, patriotic tendencies. I guess patriotism's okay. It's the <laughs> nationalism we're worried about. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, it's, it's a cool, I mean, I don't know, we could maybe even play a little bit of this video. Yeah. It's their about video. Hopefully the audio will work as well. Oh, and we're having that problem. My <laughs> aunts, my uncles, and my father, and my cousins, I mean, everybody you know, was a gay they really, member. They really, I think what they're doing is they're they isolating the fact that you need to have a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, yeah. and any sort of meaningful identity, a collective, whether it's your family, um, to try and, again, you know, just mobilize against extremism. Yeah. And then, I, mean, I, mean, I think some, one of the efforts that's been tried, what they're hoping to do is try something new and say maybe the, the common factor isn't the belief itself. Yeah. Maybe right. it is the young people, and so let's at least have the conversation about it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say for sure. It's certainly, it seems idealistic yeah. to think you can lump everybody together and yeah, say, that, oh, That's just, what I'm yeah. saying, because I feel like I've definitely encountered some people with very extreme ideologies in the yeah. past, and I don't know if they're all motivated by the same things. And right. to say, you know, well, education is the answer, you know, what if mm -hmm. it's not? Yeah. You know, or let's say that, you know, what empowering the, the youth is the answer. What if it's not? Yeah. What if these situations are actually different? Yeah. I, I'm not saying that. They are. You know, maybe Google's premise is right. Yeah. Maybe young people who are living, running into difficult situations are just as likely to join the Crips or the Bloods or, 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 <laughs> or you know, or, or whatever other yeah, gang, yeah, yeah. MS-13, yeah. as they are to join Al-Qaeda. Right. But I don't 
that doesn't ring true to me. I think that there's specific yeah. situations yeah. in yeah. different countries that lead people to these kind of movements, and that's why the movements are different. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. You know, they're even quoting one of, or not quoting, they have a series of videos, as I said, where they're kind of featuring videos that highlight these issues, and one of them is Majid Nawaz in a one-on-one -on -one with Riz Khan. So Al Jazeera's mm -hmm. Riz Khan. The reason I mention this is because, you know, they have Who so many... Who is Majid Nawaz? Oh, that's a great question. I have no idea. I believe he's someone who, apparently, according to this, is, is saying, yeah, that he was, you know, part of what is in parentheses here, parenthetical, saying America's war on Islam. So okay. presumably, some sort of an extremist, and perhaps Muslim extremist. Yeah. I don't know, uh, to be frank with you. But, but again, at this table, you see, he's sitting alongside Jared Cohen, who I guess is chairing this, or is he? Is One he of the leading? people like helping pull us together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jared yeah. Cohen yeah. used to work with yeah. the State Department, yeah. and then now works for. Google. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a trip because the other question that comes in is how do you define who's an extremist? Yeah. I remember I was yeah. watching Peter King talking the other day about the need to be careful. Peter King's a congressman in the United States right. representing New York's uh, New York, and basically he was talking about how you've got to be careful of the radicalization of American Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now, Peter King is of Irish descent. He was a former, like, significant supporter of the IRA. So he radicalized. In, yeah, yeah. And, and, and people, it depends on who you're looking at, yeah. because some people would very clearly say that the IRA was a terrorist organization. Right. Mm -hmm. Others would say that they're freedom fighters. And so that's why I, I get nervous about this yeah. blanket, oh, it's disaffected youth. No, of course. It's is an, it? It's, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. No, that makes sense. It's Google. They got their hands on everything. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> At the same summit, they're kind of no downplaying doubt. their role in the actual uh, you know, Arab awakening, so to speak. Uh, at the same time, they're kind of taking an active role, and no one's going to argue that they shouldn't be taking an yeah. active role against extremism. But they're saying that you know they are just the conduit or the tool that a lot of brave people across the Arab world mm -hmm. um, have been using, and they want to make sure that it's clear. They're saying, you know, this is the CEO right here saying we're not the cause, nor should we get the credit for these good things. Yeah. We're simply the tools that enable courageous people to change society. Um, so I don't know why, actually, it's curious why they'd feel a need to just highlight that at the same time that they're oh, trying to... Well, because to, there have to... been other companies that have taken, or at least put Which out credit? advertisements that people have accused them of trying to take credit, and right. they got... Uh, there was like significant PR. backlash. So we, we'll right. talk so about that another day. We're not trying to day. take credit, but we want to prevent youth of the world from being radicalized. Exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and on <laughs> that note, we're going to be <laughs> talking about the youth of just the world great. in just a moment. We're about to go on air. We'll see you in a second. Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now on The Stream, a social media community with its own daily TV show. We're bringing you, as always, stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, an African spring. Could the uprisings in North Africa lead the way to greater change south of the Sahara? And as Sudan readies itself for the South secession, how are online activists responding to accusations of genocide? As always, our digital producer, Ahmed Shahab el -Din, is here looking out for your feedback. Joining us now on the couch for a second day is Baratunde Thurston. He's a self-described technology-loving comedian. He is the co-founder of political blog Jack and Jill Politics, and he's digital director for the satirical American newspaper, The Onion. Baratunde, you've got more jobs. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about what is across your radar today. In this economy, there's not any such thing as too many jobs. So I'll take all of them. Two stories on my radar. First, anything Michelle Obama does, First Lady of America, I'm kind of into. She's, I think, the best First Lady ever. She just got back from Africa. And where, her story where was she in Africa? Is, she was in South Africa, okay. trying to warm relations between the countries and do uh -huh. kind of a symbolic thing. Uh, but what, her symbolism is more powerful than others, I think. The other is a story that's troubling. I'm following at boingboing.net. They're covering a story about U.S. police departments mm -hmm. accusing people of you know, a crime, impeding their job by filming them doing their jobs. They don't want the public scrutinizing them on the job. So if you film someone with your camera phone and post it later as they're arresting someone or harassing someone in public yeah. or abusing them, they're going to prosecute you as interfering with their execution of the law. 
and this case in New York was just thrown out under those charges saying okay. it lacked all merit. That's great. I mean, yeah. because that's a very dangerous thing when people are using these devices at times to protect themselves exactly. against potential violations by law enforcement. So yep. thanks for bringing that to our attention. Always, uh, if you have stories that you want to bring to our attention, you can tweet them to us at AJ Stream. I'm Natasha Fata. I'm a Canadian journalist and I'm in the stream. The Arab uprisings we're witnessing today in Syria and Yemen got their momentum from North Africa, where the people of Tunisia and Egypt overthrew their longtime rulers. Now, I want to show you an image that is actually very interesting, something that was discussed a little bit earlier in the news. Uh, or earlier in the year, because even before the events in those countries, voters in Cote d'Ivoire had raised their voices against President Laurent Gbagbo, who after more than 10 years in power, refused to step down. This is an image of, of uh, former President Gbagbo there. If you take a look at this other video that I'd like to share, this is from Dakar. And it talks about just last week, protesters who forced Senegalese President Abdoulaye Wade to give up constitutional changes which would have made it easier for him to maintain power. Social media has made all these events much more accessible for Africans across the continent. So, could we soon be witnessing an African spring? Joining us now from South Africa, Johannesburg in particular, is Matata Seydou, a South African journalist and head of Media 24 Journalism Academy. Welcome, Matata, to the stream. We're considering this idea about uh, the possibility of an African spring. Do you think that it could happen? Yeah, the, the, the possibility is there. Um, we can, there's no way of uh, denying the fact that uh, um, when all these events happen, whether within Africa or outside Africa, uh, people watch them and see their own possibilities and they gain uh, courage and uh, <clears throat> sometimes they become successful. Um, the instance that you were pointing at in uh, Dakar last week, uh, it's, it's a case in point where uh, <clears throat> President Wad has been trying over the years to try and get his son to become uh, uh, the next president. He mm. tried to get him as a mayor, as a mayor of uh, Dakar. It didn't work in the local elections and now he wanted to change the rules completely. Uh, it, it, he, he has failed again. Here in, in, in South Africa, uh, uh, for example, we've been going through a process of a new law that was about, about to be enacted, and people have been up in arms. And the, just this past Friday, the African National Congress, despite its big majority in parliament, relented and has changed uh, uh, the kind of clauses that were uh, quite controversial. So there, there is a, a, indeed hope. In, 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 in what is being called the Arab Spring becoming mm. even a sub-Saharan uh, Well, spring. Matata, I want to ask you a question because we pose this to some of our friends. And uh, as you know, a lot of people on the continent are using social media to convey ideas that they think are important and to speak through their diasporas. So we got this tweet from David uh, K. Mpanga who said, The African Spring is coming whether or not it's televised. The primary political and demographic factors are in place. However, we also heard from at Brian Odong, who said, things tend to go from bad to worse when foreign media dig too deep. At times, we prefer to leave our ancestors asleep. I'm curious to hear your perspective, Matata. Do you think that an African spring is possible without significant international media coverage? No. Uh, the, 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 the media coverage, especially international, is very important uh, <clears throat> because it also generates other uh, international pressures as a result. Uh, <clears throat> but we must not get to a point where we start thinking that uh, simply because there is coverage, then the spring will also end in the same way that it ended in Tunisia and, uh, and Egypt. Mm -hmm. There are other political factors that one has to take into consideration in both Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, the the overwhelming uh, factor that brought the regime down was the fact that the armies in both those countries decided that they were no longer prepared to oppress people in the name of the uh, dictator. Mm -hmm. That was crucial. And even when you look at Yemen, you look at Libya, you look at Syria, the fact that those uh, uh, struggles are... <clears throat> 
perpetuating in the manner in which they are. It's also a result of the fact that the armies in those countries still want to stay with the dictator. The no. same applies to Zimbabwe and uh-huh. Swaz- Swaziland, for example. You know, this is a wonderful point that Matata raises yeah. because I got a tweet from G- at Gail Masengi who says, I don't see, speaking of, our, of African swing, says, I don't see that coming anytime soon or late. In the South, we won't stand the heavy armed security forces who pledge allegiance to the regimes. In terms of both the media coverage, not necessarily from a mainstream perspective, but the social media coverage that helped amplify many of the voices in the Arab Spring, a lot of that was possible because people had an attention span for it. And with so much that has happened, you see some sense of revolution fatigue possible among members of the international kind of social media public. Do you see that as an issue in the possible African Spring? And with respect to the military, do you see any shifts among any militaries in these countries more toward the people and away from the regime as pressure is ratcheted up through public demonstration? Uh, I I suppose we all should say we live in hope uh, (laughs) that one day even the security forces in Zimbabwe, the security forces in Swaziland will see reason to ditch the dictator. But at the moment, that is not on the cards as we speak now. Uh, Matata, I'm just going to ask you not to repeat this question, but a lot of people are raising the fact that, you know, Mita Bill is saying factors like slow internet connections along with online censorship will be problems for any potential African spring. Um, but then uh, Sia Africa is saying, will the African spring be an area-specific revolution or will the whole continent rise up? The reason I ask is because we said technology played a big role in Tunisia and Egypt, and we know that there's many uh, elections coming up. As you mentioned, Congo, Gabon, I think it's in November and December, there's parliamentary elections and president, presidential elections. What do you think? Is it going to be a specific in certain countries, or can you anticipate it all? Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's going to depend on um, factors on the ground. Um, you, you, you need a spark, uh, both in, uh, if, if you take Tunisia, uh, uh, the fact that uh, Mohammed bent himself to death uh, uh, gave the spark, and their victory gave the spark to the Egyptians, and then everybody thought they could do it. <laughs> the 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 penetration of social media within Africa is still very minimal uh, in sub-Saharan Africa because of the cost uh, and uh, the slowness of connectivity and all of those things. But there is all this uh, new cable that is being laid on the eastern seaboard of Africa, which is going to revolutionize the, the, the penetration of, of um, uh, social media. So the, the, the cost is going to go down, more people are going to be able to, 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 to participate, and that should uh, uh, help us. But in a place like Zimbabwe, for example, if, you, if we were to just concentrate on Zimbabwe for a minute, uh, <clears throat> the bulk of your kind of middle class that uh, would be easy to mobilize through social media are either in South Africa or London. Mm. Uh, the the bulk of the people who remain at home are in rural areas where this mobilization through social media it's really to a large extent a mirage Mm -hmm. you know Matata I want to thank you for bringing these points up one of the things we've learned a lot is that there's significant mobile penetration in Africa we're going to be looking to see if that winds up playing a role as things move forward appreciate you uh, coming and sharing your thoughts with us thank you Now, be sure to follow this story on our website, stream.aljazeera.com. You're going to find more videos and links to our top stories there. Uh, You can get a lot more deep into this, the information we've been talking about right there online. Ahmed, tell us a little bit about what people are saying to us online right now. Right. We've seen so many suggestions from all over the world, but we're going to focus on the international aid flotilla that's headed to Gaza because a lot of people are asking us to, to, to talk about this, and they also have comments. We'll start with Yasir Tine, who's saying the flotilla, too, is our defining moment in changing the stereotype of Palestinian violent resistance, which is why, he says, Israel fears it. Now, uh, we've also seen a lot of tweets asking us about this Israeli video hoax, right? So I know you know about this, Baratunde, because you actually tweeted us um, the New York Times article before many other people did. It was faster than saying it out loud to you. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, But, uh, you know, the story broke on the Electronic Intifada site, and I'm just going to scroll down here and play this video 
Um, this is a YouTube video featuring this man who presents himself as an American gay rights activist, disillusioned with the latest Gaza flotilla campaign, and this has turned out to be a hoax. Now, he claims to be Mark, this American guy, um, and he claims that he reached out to organizers of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, uh, but was insulted and told on the grounds that he is gay, he cannot participate. Uh, but as it turns out, he's really an Israeli man named Omer Gershon, who's actually quite popular in the Tel Aviv gay community. Yeah. So the question is, is this video a hoax, or is it part of perhaps a larger propaganda you know, initiative yeah. to kind of detract attention from the flotilla and kind of discredit the, the activists? What do you think? So it was actually tweeted by uh, some Israeli government offices, or at mm -hmm. least people who worked within them, and his underlying point is, be careful who you get in bed with. It may lead to Hamas. Right. And so there is a political point, but mm -hmm. when it's couched in what uh, phrase I heard coined last week as civic right. fiction, mm -hmm. does that undermine the underlying political argument yeah. when you're using a layer of deception to get it out? That's true. I mean, a lot of people are really uh, curious as to why the prime minister's office has yet to deny that they had any mm -hmm. active part in right. creating and producing the video because they did tweet it out from the foreign ministry's account and the well, press Well, apparently office. a number, a couple of different... Uh, places, right. uh, government accounts, did tweet it out. And it reminds you, us of the uh, story in Syria where you had another, yeah, gay uh, you know, a gay girl in Damascus yeah. and right. we found out that that was a hoax. I'm not sure what further information is going to come out from this one, but it's interesting to realize why would someone put a well-known actor right. as the protagonist in a fake video? Yeah, it's true. I mean, a lot of media reports, you know, the Haaretz paper in Israel is waiting for, you know, a proper response, I guess, right. from the prime minister in terms of how involved they were, if at all. Um, so well, the internet finds you out. That's the other lesson yeah. in this. The internet yeah. eventually uncovers it. We'll Absolutely. wait and see. We'll wait and see. Um, so this story about the flotilla 2 is only one of many stories that you've shared with us. But of course, there are many more. Um, here are some hashtags you're using to actually track the stories you care about. Our next story was suggested to us by community member Moez Ali in Kuwait, who goes on Twitter by at his underscore Moezness. He asked us to look into the issues surrounding the division of Sudan as the South gets ready to mark its independence from the North on July 9th. Violence in the disputed Abyei region has led human rights activists to renew claims of genocide against the government of President Omar al-Bashir. However, those accusations have raised concerns that the narrative of Sudan has become overly simplistic, with Western-backed campaigns reducing the conflict to a simple story of good versus evil, casting the North as an aggressor and relegating the South to victimhood. Sudanese digital activists say the story is much more complex and they are going online to respond. We're fortunate to have joining us now via Skype Amir Ahmed, who writes the blog Sudanese Thinker, and also joining us from Kampala is Sudanese human rights worker Osman Humaida, who's executive director for the African Center for Justice and Peace Studies. Welcome both of you to the stream. Ahmed, let's start with you, actually, um, Sudanese Thinker. Tell us what you think is wrong in the Western depiction of what's happening in Sudan. Well, there are generally three problems with Western media coverage of Sudan. So, one, there is oversimplification, okay, and the genocide label, how it's so casually thrown around, like that's, that's a perfect example of this oversimplification. Two, exaggeration, sensationalism, and overdramatization, which I think happens across the board with many other issues. And then three, you, ha you have heavy politicization in favor of the South and Darfur, and, you know, this ends up being alienating for many northern Sudanese, the majority of whom do not support the government in Khartoum. So those are three key problems, oversimplification, exaggeration, and heavy politicization in favor of the South and uh, for Now, I just want to make, make, make sure that I, that I state this um, you know, and, and be very unequivocal. It's, it's clear that if you look at the history of Sudan, it has been the northern government, which has been the main aggressor against, you know, the southerners and, and you know, has marginalized Dar the Darfurians as well. But to just paint it as that with, without really including a lot of the other details, the nuances, um, has, is, is not really helpful, especially when you have um, organizations like the Save Darfur Coalition and Enough Project. And by the way, Save Darfur is actually cr criticized in the New York Times in an article in June 2007 
And um, they were criticized for, you know, precisely what I just stated, you know, um, a little bit of exaggerations and using tone and, and content that, that has gotten them in trouble with aid groups on the ground in Darfur, aid groups that are actually informed. Uh, and but, Amir, some- let, me, let me ask you a question on that, on that front, because one of the concerns that comes up oftentimes is that the media is not covering what's happening in a given area. Here we're talking about an area where there is some coverage. Some have argued that there's not enough coverage going on in Sudan. Is it a greater ill if you find that some of these aid groups are exaggerating their particular causes, or would it be a greater ill if we weren't having coverage when significant numbers of people are being killed? Well, it's, it's tough to answer the question if you put it that way. Because here's the thing, like simplistic coverage and over-exaggeration. You know, like, yes, we're very grateful that there is coverage, you know, at, at least. But the danger in, in having a simplistic narrative is that um, policymakers can end up pushing for very simplistic solutions. I mean, we have the Save Darfur Coalition. And, and, you know, back in 2006, 2007, around then, they were pushing for military intervention. Some of them, not all, not as a you know, policy and, Mm -hmm. you know, and no fly zone. So there there has been a very hawkish uh, stance on these issues. And and that's the danger in having this kind of reporting. So So, I want to go to, I want to get Usmani's uh, thoughts on this. And Usmani, I know that we've got uh, your uh, audio, but I know your video is frozen, but we should be having you via audio. Talk to us about your impression of what's happening in Abia in particular. You know, we've heard in Darfur, the African Union, uh, I think uh, a human Amnesty International have not declared what's happened in Darfur as a genocide as many others have. What about Abye? Is there genocide happening there? Uh, the, thank you. Um, without jumping to, to uh, definition of, uh, of uh, what is going on in, in, in Abye, whether it is a genocide or not, I think this is the same situation in, in, in Darfur when there is international uh, uh, mission of inquiry into uh, the crime committed in Darfur. However, they come to the conclusion that there is, there is killing, there is attack, there is forcible displacement of uh, civilians. And, and, and these acts of war crime and crime against humanity, however, the, the report of the International Commi- Commission of Inquiry at that time stopped short of describing the situation as a genocide because there is a, a missing element, as I said, which is the uh, genocidal intent. Exactly. However, uh, and they describe that only a competent court can decide is that. However, on case-by-case basis, which is the International Criminal Court, have recently added to the charges against President Bashir the crime of genocides. I'm not here into going into detail. What's happening in ABA? Uh, is there an, a forcible displacement of uh, civilian population? Yes. The entire community, Denka community of ABA, had been displaced out of the town, of the area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is 117,000 uh, people had been driven out of ABA when the Sudanese army, uh, accompanied by militia, have entered the city. So an entire population of a city had been uh, displaced forcibly from their homes. There is a dist- this is a war crime, by the way, and war crime is not less heinous or serious than genocides. Mm-hmm. By any way, genocide is part of the war crime in a way. Uh, is now, there I, a actually, I'm sorry, Usman, or- I want to I want to get Amir involved in this, and I was actually. A question that came to us about the Arab revolutions and the kind of protests that happened in different places via Twitter and why some of this may not have been happening in Sudan. And Amir, I want to pose that question that I think Ahmed has got on his screen. Mm-hmm. It's actually regarding this question of why protests were not happening in Sudan in the same way. Um, there were protests that took place in January and the main protests that happened, they were organized by university students through Facebook. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people did go and show up. But unfortunately, there was not a lot of momentum and, and the protests did not gain traction. I think at the very most, a conservative estimate would be, you know, a couple of hundred people um, here and there that, that went out. And there was a very brutal crackdown, which was underreported, not surprisingly. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, many activists were imprisoned, mm-hmm. uh, one of whom I know online. He's a blogger. Um, he was severely tortured as well for his participation um, in these protests. So there were protests, but unfortunately they did not pick up you know, and gain the sort of momentum that we've seen elsewhere. Because I think 
you know, when you look at Sudanese history, we've just had so much chaos and, and so many problems, and the economy is so terrible right now. People just don't have an appetite to, to really go out and do the same thing. Amir, but let me I ask you a follow-up to that, because yeah. you said, you said Amir, uh, that there was this element of, you know, maybe everyone doesn't necessarily support the, uh, the policies of Bashir. I'm curious to what is the relationship between people in the north and the south of Sudan themselves. Do people in the Sudan, south of Sudan, perceive that there's not uh, significant support for Bashir in the north? You mean like uh, amongst the people themselves? Yes. The, the, the southerners know that, that um, you know, northerners are not happy with, with the government. Um, the majority are not happy. I mean, if you go into ideological reasons, it gets very complicated. But when you focus just on corruption, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very straightforward. The majority... Um, dislike and are very against the uh, Khartoum regime. Of course, you know, with the exception of those who are benefiting from the corruption. So, I mean, Baratunde, I okay. want to actually get you involved yeah. here. So, it seems that, in a nutshell, their media is not giving the full story. What are some of the dangers that come out if it's not accurately reported? Well, one, you miss, you know, the, the level of international attention that can get a little bit more focus. Two, a non-overly simplistic policy. Mm -hmm. What I'm mm -hmm. curious about is with the upcoming official split, of North and Southern Sudan, what are you guys noticing on the ground among those populations about how this is all going to play out? Is this you know, a, a moment of great fear and anxiety? Is it a moment of excitement? Is it something else that I can't put into words just yet? U Usman, we'd love to hear from you on yeah. that. Yeah, it's true. We, we, we issued actually, uh, my center, the African Center for Justice Peace Studies, we issued two reports on, on uh, the recent uh, youth and student demonstration in Khartoum. One we called it silencing the new front and uh, uh, stepping in the tide against, which is we documented torture and other uh, degrading and inhuman uh, treatment by the protesters. And one of the protesters, as he mentioned, Ahmed, he's a blogger and a rabbi, actually. Yes. And he was shaved and electron he was uh, have electric shocks. And many students went through the same ordeal. And for the first time, actually, uh, the government have use the same strategy of oppression that they have used in, in the conflict area, which is sexual violence and rapes. Exactly. And we have uh, at least two stories of young students who come out and talked about their ordeals of being raped and multiple raped by, uh, uh, while they are in the, uh, in, in the security custodies. Okay. Now, I want to ask uh, the, the both the of you, actually, I'm sorry, Usman, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to ask you and Amir to stay with us because we're closing the main show, but we're going to continue this conversation in the post show. I'll ask that you stay. Baratunde, it's been great having you great here. Uh, Ahmed, as always, uh, please stay with us. Join us on our website at stream.aljazeera.com. You can tweet us your thoughts and join this conversation by tweeting us at AJStream. We're continuing online. We will see you there. Hi and welcome to the post show. We're here at stream.alzeera.com continuing this conversation about the ongoing situation in the Sudan. Ahmed, I saw that you were getting a number of tweets. There was one interesting one you had that specifically brought up the issue of oil in Abia. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you guys are back. I hope you can hear us. Um, I was trying to get this into the main show because I think it's an important point and Derek raised it um, briefly. But, you know, a lot of people talk about the problem with kind of using a generalized narrative. A lot of people refer to Abaye and also, I believe, uh, Southern Kordofan as being oil rich. But then we have this one tweet from El Zubair saying, that's an exaggeration, it's outright silly. Abaye is, uh, the example being that Abaye is oil rich, he says that it's actually not oil rich, and we've seen that around Abaye the region is oil rich. So I guess, you know, my question is, you know, we know nearly three quarters of the oil that is pumped from Sudan is from the south, but all the refineries are in the north. So with a split, what I'm really interested in finding out is how important is it? Like, for example, Amir, you're from Khartoum. Do you think that President Omar al-Bashir has overreacted to the crisis in Abiyye? And why are journalists calling it oil rich if it's not? Well, why, why are journalists calling it oil rich? I think that's just lazy journalism. Has he overreacted to... The, and, and, and keep in mind, the reason that the northern government troops entered Abia was because um, the southern uh, soldiers have attacked a group of uh, northern 
armed uh, forces, right? So the attack was provoked, but I think it, it was, you know, maybe maybe they did overreact uh, to, to a great extent, especially in terms of the violence that happened over that and how they went and, and displaced so many people. I was asking specifically about the aerial bombardments, because we know there's talk about bringing an Ethiopian peacekeeping troop in, and so I'm trying to you know, figure out what will remedy the situation in Abia. Well, I, I think the move to bring in Ethiopian troops is a very good one. Um, you know, the Ethiopians are more or less trusted by both sides, and I, I do believe that they will be a neutral party. Okay. So for now, at least that's good to diffuse tensions. Mm-hmm. Now, Usman, the, we're seeing that the, the split is going to happen mm-hmm. on July 9th, but it seems that some of these tensions, and tensions have been ratcheting up. Do you expect to see more violence following the actual secession of the South? Sure. If, if uh, the international community does not engage in a repulsed and, and, and in a positive way, trying to mitigate against uh, this uh, flashpoint and that might lead to violence in Abia, in Blue Nile, and in uh, the Nuba Mountain, uh, there is a number of issues need to be settled, which is a, a new political arrangement should have to be reached between both the government and the SPLM, the North Sector, which is because the Nuba Mountain is part of the North. Uh, Blue Nile is part of the North, and ABA, uh, its future, have yet to be decided. However, regardless of the outcome of, of, the, of the referendum of ABA, that is, uh, security and protection of civilians should be um, ensured. The Security Council actually had issued yesterday a resolution 1990 on the situation on ABA, which is calling on the government uh, of Northern Sudan to immediately withdraw its forces, and to deploy the Ethiopian one, as Ahmed talked about. But there is other issues, uh, including the, uh, the, the security arrangement and, and the political arrangement for, for, for North Darfur, uh, sorry, South Kurdufan, and Blue Nile should be reached. Uh, the African Union is broken that, uh, play as a, uh, as a broker to reach uh, an agreement on this contingent issue. We, there should be a, a repost capable and international uh, deployment of forces in this border area. And this, there should be a demilitarization of a zone of demilitarization from both sides. And already the UN have a presence in Sudan under Chapter 7, which is the UNMIS. The South have agreed to extend the mandate. Khartoum is reluctant. But regardless of, of, of uh, so far, the Security Council have to decide on that. What are they are going to do in terms of ensuring of uh, the protection of the civilian? If the national state uh, in, in the south and north failed to protect their own civilian, then according to the very text which passed by the, by the head of the state in 2005, international community have the responsibility to resume uh, responsibility for protecting civilian issue of sovereignty. State sovereignty is no longer valid when it comes to the protection of civilian from war crime, crime against humanity, genocide, and ethnic cleansing. That is very clear, mm-hmm. and that is what the head of state had agreed on, including President Bashir. He signed that document, uh, allowing the international community to intervene when the national, uh, the sovereign state, have failed to protect its own people. And it is a clear case there, and the international community keep talking about the last, uh, over the last year, about flashpoint in uh, ABA, uh, Blue Nile, and South Kurdufan. They did nothing to mitigate against uh, this. And yet again, when the violence happened over the last two weeks, little had been done to protect the civilians. Now, and we know that. I, w- I want to stop you there because we're coming close to the end of our time. Amir, I want to leave you with one last question before we go. Uh, the ge- issue of genocide, we have considered whether or not that may be a term that's bandied around too loosely. However, what do- role do you think that religion and ethnicity play in this conflict? Ooh, <laughs> that's, that's a complicated one. <laughs> Even the stuff <laughs> is smiling there. <laughs> What role can, I, can I get to this? Can I get go, to this? Go ahead, I, I jump, in, jump in. I, I, I don't think this is a religious or ethnic conflict. It's not Arab, African, it's right. not Christian, Muslim. This is a, a group of people cling to power in Khartoum. They're trying to mobilize people along the lines of religion and ethnicity. 
And that is a dangerous game they are doing. They mobilize early in the 90s people for the jihad against the infidel and the Christian. They're trying to manipulate people in, in, in Darfur and to divide them among Islamic line, Arabs versus African. They're trying now to incite and mobilize the Messiri against the Denka. Messiri and the Denka, they coexist for hundreds of years in a peaceful way. Right. The Messiri have taken the south and the Denka Nogok have taken also and have trade to do with the Messeria. Both sides have interest to have a peaceful coexistence. Uh, both sides in North and South trying to politicize that and trying to uh, to manipulate the civilian Absolutely. population for their interest. Osman, I want to thank Sorry. you and Amir on that note. I want to thank you for elucidating the issue and taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you. Thank you. This is quite a story. I mean, there's so much going on there. Yeah. There's so much complexity to it. I'm glad we had the opportunity to discuss this mm -hmm. with them. I don't think this is going to be the last time this issue is coming across no. our radar. Doubtless. Doubtless. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to have an opportunity to talk to another one of our friends on Skype in a few minutes. But uh, I want to go before we do that back to this issue of the African uh, spring. Yeah. And I, I actually feel really strongly, and I've heard from a lot of other people similar thoughts that you know, it's almost like the price of African life is seen as lower in the eyes of the international media. And I know mm -hmm. this is a strong statement to make, yeah. but we see uh, time and time again, whether you look at what happened in Rwanda, whether you look at what's ongoing in eastern uh, Congo, if you look at all these different kinds of conflicts, it's like people lose their lives and mm -hmm. there doesn't seem to be the same kind of response from the media. Is I, I just don't see how an African spring happens unless the rest of the world takes a true and genuine interest. Yeah. There's just one tweet that like is kind of related to that, you know, about why the rest of the world hasn't taken an interest. And Gutmang is highlighting Stefan Guchar is saying Africa is full of wealth, diamonds, as you know, oil, cocoa, rich land, water, energy. Mm -hmm. Yet people lack basic commodities like one big colony. And perhaps that, you know, frankly, it, it's it's tough to say, but perhaps that sheds some light as to why people maybe don't particularly care as much, which is I think what you were saying, you know, that when mm -hmm. when Africans. Yeah even die, it doesn't make a, as big a story because it's kind of this perpetual thing that only gets attention occasionally. Well, and then as a, as a Westerner myself, and certainly a heavy observer of Western media, we don't draw the connection to Africa except as a problem. It's right. the yeah. dark continent, yes. it's the lost continent, mm -hmm. there's the hunger, hopeless famine, continent, strike, hopeless according continent. According to the These are official titles of our, right. of our major media yeah. organizations. And with so much conflict already going on, challenging Western attention, yeah. it's convenient, very convenient, and even somewhat understandable, though certainly not helpful, to dismiss the entire region as, oh, there it goes again. What could I possibly do? What does this have to do with me? Well, that's Policy what I wise, think we also was, don't invest in the leaders. I think that was one thing. of the things that was so good uh, about what was just stated um, by our guest there, that this is a problem with oversimplification. Yeah. So right. we're going to get another guest in now via Skype. Joining us from Cairo is Ramesh Srinivasan. He's been on the couch with us before. He's a professor at UCLA. Thank you, Ramesh, for joining us. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about this idea of an African spring. I know that you're there right. in uh, Egypt, where a lot of this energy has come from. Tell me a little bit about what you think are the prospects for a similar kind of movement in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, you know what? It's actually really pertinent to what you guys were talking about today on the show because I've been interviewing uh, activists who are both on-the-ground activists, community organizer activists, as well as people who are both bloggers and on-the-ground activists, and many of them are directly in contact with specifically Sudanese activists. Mm -hmm. So what we're mm -hmm. finding here is there's this network of activists that t that already took shape between Tunisia and Egypt, and that's correspondingly taking shape between Egypt and Sudan right now. Wow, that's interesting. Go ahead. Ramesh, I'm just going to kind of put you yeah. on the spot. And by the way, hey, good, great to have you. I, nice a lot to of my, see you guys. A lot of my friends in Egypt are telling me you're asking a lot of good questions uh, across <laughs> Too Cairo. Too many questions. So one yeah. question for, for you from David Shiner saying, um, should we worry that springs will become familiar to powers uh, that be, and that an African spring will eventually be suppressed with even new tactics. Like, what's your take on this, just being, so, frankly, in Africa? It's actually a great question. So the key, the key issue here, which was successful in Egypt, is somehow the small 10% or under group of people who were active online were able to tap into networks, because the vast majority of people who were in Tahrir Square, who were in Cairo and Alexandria and all the districts on the street are not social media users. So the question is, is what makes these people roll out? 
And once that question can be answered and sufficiently achieved in these other nations, then I think there'll be in a sufficient enough groundswell to actually be able to counter these types of governmental tactics. But of course, ultimately, like one of your previous guests said, mm. the question of where the military sides ends up being a big issue. Yeah. What do you guys think is the biggest obstacle? Well, well I have another question that's uh, follow yeah. on to that was, as you're going around sort of deconstructing, reverse engineering what actually happened Persist. in Egypt versus what we've read about happening mm. in Egypt or on Twitter, to what extent is the class of the people with the technological access, mm -hmm. very active on social media. How has that played out, especially post-revolution? Right, so, so post-revolution, it's even more sexy to be on social media than it was before. But there's no question that there's heavy amounts of homogeneity in terms of youth demographics. This is a very young country, yeah. but also in terms of income and literacy and technological access demographic. We're talking about the top 5 to 10 percent of the income and education spectrum in the country. However, a lot of these guys who are social media users are connected to hardcore labor union organizers, political activists, dissidents, and some of those dissidents themselves mm -hmm. have used and utilized social media like April 6th leadership. Mm -hmm. And so we see that kind of really interesting synergy between people who know the ground, who know the communities, who know how to mobilize on the street, and people who are using social media. They call themselves a family here. You know, it's intriguing the points from Esther's bringing up about the kind of cross politicization of yeah. ideas from different people. I was in Ramallah a few days ago, actually, and I spoke with a young Palestinian activist who had been hearing from ANC activists. Yeah. And I think it's worth bringing up mm -hmm. that a lot of these freedom movements, yeah. at least on the African continent, we can take a lot of uh, historical cues from what happened in South yeah. Africa. I was in the Republic of Georgia a couple of months ago and met uh, Serb people connected to Serbian activists who had studied Gandhi and yeah. King and passed on their lesson to Georgian activists yeah. and passed on those lessons to Egyptian activists over the past two years, so, laying the groundwork for a lot so of So in things. a way, we're seeing a globalization of this movement towards uh, you know, personal freedom and liberation. Yeah. Ramesh, we want to thank you so much for joining us from Cairo. We really appreciate Great it. We know it's guys. late over there. Fantastic <laughs> Great to see, see you guys. too, see man. You guys soon. Absolutely. Hope so. Baratun Day, second day with us. It's been great. We hope that you'll come back. Pleasure. With us. Absolutely. And Ahmed, you're dope. I love the jacket. <laughs> I love the jacket. Yes. Love the jacket. Yes. Love the jacket. Love the thank you for joining us once again in the stream. We will see you again online, and you can tweet us as always at AJStream.